Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Analytical Variations, Old Problem, New Consequences, presented by Matt Haskin, CEO of Certus Analytics and founder of Canisafe Analytics. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Matt Haskin. I will now turn the presentation over to him. All right, thank you. And thank you to Lab Roots to have the opportunity to present today and for all of you that are taking the time to uh, come and listen to what I have to say. So today I wanted to just kind of briefly discuss what we call analytical variation. Um, this is an old, old problem. Um, it goes way back in all industries, but it has you know new consequences right now to, to our um, emerging commercial cannabis market. All right, so my name again is Matt Haskin. I was the founder and former CEO of Canisafe Analytics. Uh, that was the first cannabis lab in the world to become accredited to the ISO 17025 standard. Uh, that was back in 2012. Uh, recently, um, I opened a second laboratory called Certus Analytics. We are licensed by the BCC and ISO accredited as well. So Lab Roots gave me the topic of the most challenging lab-related issues of 2019. Okay, and so in kind of thinking about what that may be, there's a lot of obviously challenging in this emerging, you know, industry with complex matrices of the cannabis plants. Um, you know, I'm thinking about all the different methods that we had to develop. Uh, there are no published methods. So over the years, you know, there was obviously method development and validation, working with complex and ever-expanding uh, matrices, especially in edible formats, right? We see everything from, you know, the baked goods, the cookies, the uh, ice creams, to beef jerky, to popcorn, uh, you know, tablets, you name it. You know, we've seen it. We've had to figure out how to, you know, extract the, uh, the analyte of interest, in this case, our cannabinoids, and uh, recover those and analyze those. Um, ISO accreditation is always a challenge. Um, I feel all these have been past challenges. Um, and so, therefore, I want to talk about, you know, a challenge that um, has been with us, the lab industry, uh, and with me uh, since day one. And that is obviously, you know, where we come into the topic of uh, analytical variation. Okay, so what is analytical variation? Analytical variation um, is essentially the, uh, the differing of results between two labs or the difference in results uh, inside the same lab for the same sample, All right? So we have interlab and intralab. Um, and, you know, we wonder how does that happen? How can one sample have two different measurements, if you will, right? We're measuring an analyte, whether that's THC or CBD or even a pesticide compound, how could it have two different measurements? Well, that is kind of the topic of discussion today and, and what causes that. How do we you know, move forward knowing um, there's always going to be analytical variation uh, and you know, what can we do about it, best practices, and how can regulators and um, industry participants you know, work within these parameters? So the causes of variation in measurement, right? Obviously, we have the big one, lack of industry standardization. So there are no standard methods or published methods that every lab would then adhere to. Uh, so we have each lab essentially has their own validated, hopefully validated method that they're working with. Um, there's been a big push for standardization. Um, at some point it'll come. That's just one of the areas. I don't think that is the overriding cause, but it's one. Um, obviously validated methodologies, right? 
Um, so we're all using our own methods. Uh, if they're not validated, there's going to be major variance uh, amongst results in that point. What's the difference in our quality management systems, our QA, QC? Um, how do we adhere to those quality management systems to create reproducibility uh, in our measurements? And then, of course, we have the technical competence of staff and qualifications of staff. Okay. And I think one of the most important that I want to dive into a little bit deeper today is what we call the uncertainty of measurement, right? So this is part of the analytical variations. We have an uncertainty of measurement. And within a lab, we call that our uncertainty budget, okay? So all measurements have an uncertainty regardless of the precision or the accuracy of the measurement, right? There is very, tr <laughs> there are very few true measurements, right? They must be traceable back to NIST. Um, and in the case of cannabis, you will never have a cannabis plant, a cannabis product with a true known value, okay? Uh, we'll have a measurement of that value, um, and we our goal is to get it as close and precise to the true value as possible, understanding that there will be error, right? So we're gonna talk about different ways that we do that, okay? And the difference between the measured value and the true value is what we call an error, the error uh, or the bias. So what contributes to the measurement uncertainty? Okay, first of all, we have two categories essentially. One is trueness. Trueness is the estimate of that measurement, the estimate of the systematic error. Okay, so systematic would be our instrument, for example, a GC or an LC or an HPLC. Right. If we take that instrument in one sample and we inject it 10 times, the exact same sample, there will be a deviation, some type of variation that the instrument... Okay, precision is the estimate of the random error. Random error is essentially human error, right? So knowing those two things, okay, we can determine our uncertainties. And the uncertainty is what every lab should have for almost every compound that they measure. Okay, we need to understand what contributes to this uncertainty. So again, we just spoke about it. We have analytical instruments, which is systematic. Again, our HPLCs, our GCs, our LCMSs, uh, we have our sap sample prep instruments, right? This is both random and systematic because we use um, calibrated measuring tools such as pipettes, analytical balances, okay? In, in an ISO accredited laboratory, all of our measuring tools and instruments are calibrated by another accredited calibration lab, at least annually, and then daily and weekly, they have internal checks um, and logs that we maintain to ensure that we are creating as small as an uncertainty based on a weight or a volume um, as we can, and that's all in the sample prep of the sample. Um, of course, our technicians, right, your staff and your technicians, your technical staff, uh, that's the random error. That is human error. That's just inherent in uh, anything that we do as human beings. Again, sampling, a representative sample. Uh, you know, we have statistical uh, sampling protocols to get the most representative sample as possible. But when you're dealing with 50 pounds of biomass and we're taking 80 grams of that biomass as a representative sample. So again, random error in the sampling. And then finally, we have certified reference material. That's the closest we have to a true value, right? So that certified reference material or standard as we call it, uh, is where we kind of base our measurement from, right? So that will be the basis of our measurement and it's the closest reference we have to a true value. So when we have these results uh, in variation of measurement, what does that mean? So let's just say, for example, in a, you know, in cannabis flower, right? We have the same sample, could be 16.5% from one lab. One lab could come back and say it's 19.4%, okay? We have a uh, chocolate, you know, an infused chocolate. Maybe the target was 100 milligrams. One lab could say it's 92. One lab could say it's 108, okay? That represents a plus or minus error of 8% with an overall swing of 16%. So now you see where it starts to seem dramatic. However, 
it's a plus or minus of 8%. And in our uncertainties, we don't understand if it's a plus or a minus, and there are no corrections for that. It's simply plus or minus. So if the, if the true value, of course we wouldn't know this, of that cannabis flower was 18%, one lab could measure it at 16.5, and the second time they ran it, it could be 19.4, okay? So those are some of the frustrating, obviously frustrating uh, uh, components for the producers, cultivators, and so forth. Um, but what we're getting into now, the new consequences of this variation are what you see there on the summary, uh, and that would be a fail, right? When your product or your crop fails regulatory testing, now you're looking at destroying 50 pounds of flour, potentially 150,000 units of a finished product, which could be vape cartridges. Um, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars, that has to be destroyed because you failed a test. Now, could that test have been, would, could you have failed that test based on, you know, some measurement uncertainty? It's quite possible. It's not always the reason, but it's quite possible. So when I use these examples of uh, plus or minus 8%, you can see there, that is the uh, criteria that is set for prescription drugs in pharma, okay? Plus or minus 8%, meaning, you know, your 100 milligram Oxycontin, I don't know if they come in that strength, but 100 milligram, you know, prescription drug, right, could be 92 or it could be 108. You know, I think most of us take those prescription drugs at face value and it says 100 milligrams, we believe we're getting 100. Well, the reality is it's not unlike what we deal with every day. There is a variation and in their tolerance is plus or minus 8% for this one. So the basis of our measurement is comes from our certified reference materials, right? Our standards. It's the closest we have to a true value that we know. <clears throat> so again, we would take that as gospel. We get a um, reference standard for THC, it's 1,000 parts per million, 1,000 ppm. We assume it's 1,000 ppm. We use uh, that reference standard to set the curve. You'll see the middle box there on the slide is our calibration curve. And these I just pulled off the internet. They're um, just examples, but this is an example of a calibration curve, right? And all those points are different uh, concentrations of that THC standard, for example, with the high point being 1,000 parts per million and maybe that low point at the very bottom being one part per million. To the right of that is the chromatogram. Once the sample is uh, put onto the either HPLC or the GC, um, you know, it's gonna separate all the compounds. That is the purpose of chromatography to separate the compounds. And then we read the, the abundance underneath the, the peak, right? The area under the peak will determine its concentration. We match that to our calibration curve and voila, we get a potency measurement. Okay, so using that certified reference materials, you see, is extremely important into the final uh, end determination, you know, of the of the measurement. So now we're going to take a look at this is a COA certificate of analysis on certified reference material for Delta Nine THC, and in this example, I'm using Absolute Standards reference material. Um, Absolute Standards has been around for. Decades, uh, they have been in the you know the reference material and chemical business for for years and years. Uh, quality, they hold every accreditation uh, possible. So, I'm not picking on them. I'm just using them to show some examples here. So, in this certified reference material COA for our Delta Nine standard, okay. And I apologize, I don't have a pointer, but if you look in the middle of that COA, you'll notice some things where they already they outline their uncertainties. They have an uncertainty due to their balance. I believe they have an uncertainty, you know, within their pipettes and they have a flask uncertainty. Now, again, I apologize, I can't point this out, but if we go to the numbers about the middle of the screen and you slide to the right, you'll notice what's called the expanded uncertainty. Okay, and in this case, if you, can see the expanded uncertainty is 8.0 micrograms per milliliter, which equals PPM. So we have an 8 PPM 
uncertainty within our reference standard. This is a specific lot, by the way. So that 1,000 high point could have been 1,008, could be 992, but we're using it as 1,000. Okay, now, same company, two different lots. So now a total of three different lots we've looked at of the same Delta 9 THC standard. You'll see on one of these, if you can find that spot again, down in the middle of the numbers, we have 9.4. So in this lot, now we have an uncertainty of 9.4 parts per million, All right? And in the next one to the right, the COA to the right, Same company, same Delta 9 reference standard, lot to lot, we have an eight parts per million, nine and a half parts per million, and over 15 parts per million as a, as a deviation, an uncertainty in that measurement. Adding you know, no other variations, we have you know, a deviation of up to 1.5% already in our reference standard, okay? So, and this is the same company. Now we have multiple companies that offer certified reference material, and they're all going to vary. So my lab is running, which reference standard my lab ran, which lot it came from, there'll be a variation to the next laboratory, or even the next time you bring in the exact same sample, there could be a variation because I may be on a different lot of reference standard, right? So that's extremely important to understand. Now we get into, and that, okay, this is for potency. So, you know, there are some economic, you know, benefits to higher potency, right? We get a little, you know, maybe that you get a better purchase price for your products. Um, you know, maybe you win uh, a cannabis cup, you know, or you have bragging rights. Okay, that's, that's all good. But, you know, now we get into maybe some of the more serious you know, side effects of this variation we talked about, which would be a fail. Uh, and now you're destroying, you know, a lot of product, a lot of money. So we're going to just go ahead and take a peek now at a pesticide reference standard, right? So potency is one thing. Now we have pesticides by Phenizate, very popular pesticide. It's Fluoromite is the trade name for it. Um, hopefully no longer used, but still very prevalent. Uh, so there's two, again, two different lots from the same company and the variation, again, out of a thousand, a concentration of a thousand parts per million in one lot, 10.8 parts per million variation, plus or minus, that's plus or minus 1% variation in our standard. Another lot, 27, okay, 2.7% just in our reference standard for that pesticide analyte. Okay. And just to point out, you see the California action limit for biphenazate in inhaled products is 0 0.1 parts per million. 100 parts per billion is the action limit. Anything over that fails. Yet we're measuring these products, you know, with a benchmark that has a plus or minus 27 parts per million. So... Quickly and in conclusion, you know, I just want to, to just have that little brief discussion to make everybody aware that, you know, this uncertainty of measurement is something that, um, you know, you need to work with your lab on. You find labs and talk to your lab about their uncertainties. It's called an uncertainty budget. You can ask your lab. They should have that for you. Um, work with them on how do you use your best practices uh, to, to work within those parameters. If there's a plus or minus of 5, 10 percent, you know, how do you formulate based on the, that, that probability that, that you can have that uncertainty from your lab? Okay, so this is where you need to partner with your lab and really, really develop a relationship and work with them. Um, we obviously, you know, as, as labs, we do, it's called proficiency testing to always ensure our, you know, accuracy, if you will, um, and our, you know, limiting our error and our measurement. Um, I think it's important uh, here, obviously, for, for lawmakers and, and regulators, you know, to understand and account for these uncertainties of measurement while they're creating laws, while they're creating regulations. You know, do we need 
some plus or minus in air. And we have that in edibles in California, plus or minus 10%, which I think is a fair, uh, you know, a fair, a fair uh, acceptance range for that. So um, again, the challenge of this, just in recapping all this, the challenge for the laboratory is very similar to the challenge for the, you know, the, the participant, the client is that, you know, it's frustrating, it's maddening at times that, that the, you know, you feel that the same sample has a different measurement and certainly a wider swing when it goes in between labs. Um, and it is nothing new um, to the laboratory or analytical chemistry. It feels new to a, you know, fledgling industry such as the cannabis industry. Um, but, you know, we certainly look to narrow that range, um, but we just need to learn that, the, you know, there is, a, there is a level and a variation in that and to work within those variations. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Matt, for that informative presentation. And I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. And as a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.